Hi there, my name is Ken Mayer and I'm going to be your instructor for this course on Network Plus. Now over the time of, uh, oh, I don't know, almost 30 years, I've been working on a wide variety of different networking solutions or IT solutions. I started off, of course, as many people did, and uh, looking at uh, what we call the dumb terminals connected to a mainframe, uh, a lot of different technologies I don't even want to get into because you're going to only find them in museums. Uh, but as time went on, I started working a lot with different vendors that are involved in the networking infrastructure. My certifications include a wide variety of service provider technologies and enter uh, enterprise technologies through the use of Cisco systems, routing and switching, security-based, uh, voice over IP-based solutions, through the use of Juniper networks with uh, service uh, provider routing and switching, uh, enterprise routing and switching, as well as security and remote access technologies through the use of uh, Palo Alto networks, the next generation firewall and what they can provide for security levels. I do a lot of work in the uh, field of uh, what I guess sometimes is called ethical hacking, which means that I'll be able to talk a lot about uh, the ways in which people can abuse your networks uh, and what you need to uh, look at to uh, be able to secure those. And of course, uh, through all of that, I've done a lot of work in the Windows operating systems as well, which is an important aspect because we are creating a network usually to support some sort of server and client operating systems communication capabilities uh, back and forth to each other. So with all of that, I hope to be able to give you a lot of good insight into what it takes to make your networks work, to uh, talk about uh, the different pieces, the different components, how to make sure that they're set up correctly, ways to troubleshoot them, and how to secure them. We're going to get into the idea of routing, and remember that routing we described as being here at the network layer, because at the network layer we define what we call these broadcast domains, and uh, and we gave each one of those broadcast domains uh, basically a logical name that we described with an IP address or an IP network address. Now, in order for us to have the communications from one broadcast domain to another, also at the network layer. We have to be able to create routes so that all of these layer 3 devices that we call routers will know how to forward traffic from one broadcast domain to another. So as we're going through and looking at these communications, I want you to realize that we're going to be looking at uh, areas of the network layer with some communications and the transport layer of the OSI model and uh, at making sure that we understand the differences between uh, what happens at transport, what happens at network and the different types of protocols that we do use. So as far as uh, the dynamic host configuration protocol is concerned, it is helping us at layer 3, which is the way in which we can assign uh, the IP addresses to our machines without having to worry about maybe making a misconfiguration or having a duplicate address by doing a manual entry. So everything that deals with wireless is going to be found under the uh, IEEE of uh, 802.11, 802.11. And, uh, and then, of course, from there, uh, some people get a little confused and sometimes think, well, isn't that bridging? Well, bridging, remember, is 802.1, so this is 802.11, in that standard. Anyway, going on, uh, we look at the standards. One of the first ones that we adopted and like to use was 802.11b, which was, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, not as good as 802.11a if your definition of good uh, is something that you would measure in throughput or the amount of speed that you could transmit data. The reason we adopted it, even though it had this 11 megabits per second, is because it worked on what we call the ISM band, uh, the industrial, scientific, and uh, medical uh, uh, unlicensed frequency. And so everybody had radios that were able to wa work on that. And so it was cheaper to uh, use 802.11b than to buy all new hardware uh, to be able to get up to 802.11a which uh, in that case was at this 5 gigahertz range. Anyway, as you're contrasting it, there's more to looking at this than just the amount of bandwidth. We might also be concerned about range. We might also be concerned about legacy devices that might not uh, work with new standards. Um, and, uh, and so you can just kind of see what your options are. But anyway, at some point, when we got to 802.11g, uh, we were able to equal the uh, throughput, the speed in the megabits per second, uh, at that 2.4 uh, gigahertz frequency. And by the way, it's not the frequency that was determining the bandwidth. It was how we encoded the data as we send these little, you know, um, analog waves, uh, radio waves through the air. Uh, that's what made the uh, big difference. Now, when we got to 802.11n, and just to prove it, right, we had some good speed, 150 megabits per second. And it works, 
at either of the 2.4 or 5 gigahertz uh, frequencies. Uh, it still had pretty good range, but the big issue here is that it had this multiple input and multiple output streams. And so, uh, you know, if you were to just kind of uh, figure that I could actually combine these streams in my data transmission, then I'm going to get higher speeds. One of the latest ones to come out is the 802.11ac. It's um, and and so speed. It's saying megabits per second, uh, and if you use multiple channels, you're going to get higher speed. They're now telling us this is our new uh, one gigabit per second capable uh, method of uh, speed, I should say, uh, over wireless, and um, and that's just amazing. But uh, again, that's because it has even more streams and. Uh, as you look into the technologies about how data is encoded, you'll also see that we've made improvements there as well. So anyway, those are your standards. Those are your speeds. Uh, frequency is an important issue. And, you know, the other important issue, like I said, is legacy. And I just want to tell you that um, it's not uncommon for uh, a lot of uh, uh, access points now if they're running at 2.4 megabits per second or, or 2.4 gigahertz uh, per se uh, not per second but gigahertz speed that we combine this b and g together uh, meaning that we can work with either one on our access point some may even put the uh, b g and n together um, the problem we have is that um, and it's not as well known as it should be is that if you have somebody show up with a, let's say an old uh, radio card in their laptop or whatever uh, they're using for wireless if they can only do 802.11 b all of the other people in your network are going to slow down to that B speed. Your access point doesn't like to switch uh, back and forth uh, in the way in which it does its transmissions. Uh, and that has to do with the uh, way in which all of the devices communicate to the access point. So just be careful um, that uh, legacy machines aren't slowing down your network. Now our objective here is going to be to talk about the Open System Interconnect and the TCP IP models. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare the layers of the OSI and TCP IP, plus make sure you understand why these are important as a concept when it comes to the design of different types of protocols and types of network communications. We're going to start off with the Open System Interconnect, the OSI. Now there are seven layers to the OSI, uh, and of course they are easily enough layers one through seven. When we talk about these, we usually will break them down into the upper layers, which would be layers five, six, and seven, and the lower layers, which would be one through four. Now we're going to break them down for you and give you, uh, you know, we're going to actually kind of keep building on this entire concept and model so you understand uh, what this does for us. But first of all, the OSI was designed as an uh, basically open system. I mean, that is almost the name of it, right? The goal was is that if we had different vendors of different technologies building their communication structure around the OSI model, then it would be easier for us to be able to integrate all of these different vendors together to be able to communicate. In other words, if we all agree on communicating through TCP, then it doesn't matter if it's a Windows machine talking to a Linux machine, talking to a Macintosh machine, because they would speak the same language. The other benefit of this as an open standard is if we do any type of a change or upgrade to a protocol, that we can do that within that layer, knowing that as long as we can make the uh, whatever layer we change communicate to the one above it and below it, then it would just basically snap in without any problem. As an example, when we talk about layer 3 with the network, we're in the middle of going from IP version 4 to IP version 6, and that, that change is only going to affect at that layer how we do addresses and a few other things that we'll talk about. But the goal was is that we could put IP6 in that layer, and it would still talk to the transport layer above it and the data link layer below it, and it does. So that's uh, kind of the idea, is to encourage these open standards for all of us to be able to communicate. So we'll start with layer 7. Now layer 7 is the application layer. Now in the application layer, it is basically got, I don't know, I've heard a lot of different definitions, but the goal of the application layer is a way of, let's say, uh, how we can interact with an operating system. Now some examples would be usually HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Well, we know about that as an application layer because we use that as a program every time we open up a web browser to pull down content from the internet. Usually an HTTP has a command like get or put, in this case get, to get a uh, home page, and it would transfer over the information that was uh, in a format called HTML that would uh, then be able to be rendered as uh, something we can read through our web browser. 
So the application layer is just a way of us interacting with the operating system and usually our way of being uh, able to initiate some sort of data transfer, whether sending information or receiving information. Now the presentation layer is basically a way in which files are, well, I don't even want to say formatted. I don't also want to say stored on a hard drive because, you know, they're stored as ones and zeros no matter where we store them. But more, I guess, the format would be a good idea. As an example, in the world of graphics, we have different types of pictures, of graphics that we can use. Some we call JPEGs, JPGs. Some are TIFF files. Some are bitmaps. And they all have with them uh, a variety of different features, things that we can do with them. Some uh, give you great uh, compression. Some allow you to uh, alter it uh, literally bit by bit. Um, you know, so uh, that's, that's great that we have these different formats of files. But I guess that's the best thing that we can say about the presentation layer. Uh, for example, when I talked about at the application layer using HTTP get command to get a home page and it's uh, encoded into a language known as HTML, well, in a way, that is a type of presentation that gives us something that we can present that we can see on our screen. Now, beyond that, we also have to realize that we have to have a way of transferring this information. And so part of what we're seeing is that, you know, we've got this presentation, we've got this JPEG, we've got this HTML file, uh, Word document, whatever it is that we have. And we do have to begin to realize that a large amount of data is not going to be sent all in one big chunk across our network connections, and that we are going to be responsible for breaking it down into pieces, and after breaking it into pieces, to be able to start sending it piece by piece, so that when it's recreated on the other side, that it's back into the acceptable format that we'll be able to read those. So you can think of, again, the presentation layer as uh, that process of being able to identify how something is formatted and often, of course, it's working with that application layer to be able to actually be uh, seen or presented to you. The next layer is the session layer. Now, a session layer is a very important piece of what we do here because uh, in our communications, I mean, let's face it, if I'm uh, getting a file from a web server, if I'm sending you a document through email, I, I want my packets that I'm sending you of data to get to you and to have some sort of acknowledgement from you that you receive them so that we can keep this back and forth communications going. That's what we look at as a session, as a way of uh, finding out how to keep the communications between two points uh, whole without them either breaking, falling apart, or having uh, our data go to different locations, right? We want the two uh, endpoints to be able to communicate. There's a variety of ways in which we can do that type of uh, communications. Uh, often we hear examples of uh, making a connection to a database like SQL Server. Well, obviously, somewhere in the software, SQL is keeping track of us of, and our communications back and forth, acknowledging us. Whether it does it through uh, looking at information from the transport uh, layer below, such as a port number uh, or a series of port numbers, whether it's uh, using its own uh, ability of its own uh, program to uh, keep its own you know, back and forth communications and acknowledgments uh, like you might have in, uh, in the SQL Server, those are things that are important to us. We might have like a user ID. We might have uh, some sort of a session ID. But uh, it, it's in some ways, we have a way of being able to identify and correctly be able to have two end units talk to each other without the uh, session breaking, falling apart, or like I said, packets going in different locations. So that is the session layer, always taken care of in our software that uh, we're using for our communications. With the transport layer, we begin what we often call as the lower layers of the OSI protocols or the OSI stack. Now, at the transport layer, our goal here is to have a common language that we can communicate back and forth with. Now, the benefits, as I mentioned before, with this is that we can have a variety of different vendor operating systems all talk to each other. Windows talking to Linux, to Unix, to Macintosh OS, or any other operating system you might have. As long as we can speak a common language, then we have the ability to transfer information. So that's what happens at the transport layer. Now the transport layer has a variety of common protocols that we're going to talk about in more detail, such as the uh, transmission control uh, protocol, TCP, uh, the user datagram protocol, UDP. But over the years, there have been a number of other types of protocols that work at the transport layer that were proprietary, such as Novell Networks had uh, the SPX IPX protocol that communicated very much the same as we did with TCP, but it would work only with Novell systems uh, or you know, anybody who paid a royalty to be able to communicate on that same language. So that's another reason why OSI is there, is to help encourage open standards so that we can improve communications 
or throughout the entire uh, list of vendors rather than uh, you know trying to uh, make us all go into one you know area and say oh we can only use uh, Novell because uh, we like SPX. Um, of course now by the way Novell defaults everything into the TCP IP because again it's better to have that encouragement of open standards. So what we see with this protocol is a way of two systems being able to negotiate the back and forth conversation. Now we haven't gotten down into the you know real meat of how this works. We're just kind of giving you the overview of OSI. But as we're breaking those large files down into smaller pieces, manageable sizes, we have to have a way of transferring those, usually one piece at a time. Uh, and uh, you know, often if we're going to talk about local area networks, that's usually done over Ethernet. But this transmission of these small uh, blocks, if it's Ethernet, at the most 1,500 bytes, means that I'm going to be sending you a lot of pieces. And if I don't tell you how to reassemble those pieces, then you're not going to know what to do with it. I'm not going to send another end system a jigsaw puzzle and say, you figure it out. That's another part of what we do at the transport layer is we have a way of negotiating. So we have a way of recognizing the order in which the uh, packets have been received, how to reassemble them, how to take care of errors. A an error is something that is great with TCP. Well, it's never great, but I should say great that it can handle communication errors by being able to request retransmissions and rebroadcasts of uh, information that we didn't receive before. So that's what we're looking at, the transport layer, is a way of being able to set up that communications, to get acknowledgments, to take care of error corrections, to be able to have a common language for different types of operating systems to be able to exchange information. Now as we move to layer three, we talk about the network layer. Now we often see a lot of network equipment that operates at layer three. We call them a layer three device. The most common one is a router. Now the biggest thing about the network is that we're creating logical addresses to be able to help us figure out the best way to get to a different location. Now certainly, of course, the devices that are uh, on our way to doing the communications will segment the traffic so into these different logical addresses, and we have to have a way of putting an address on there. Now I use as an example uh, is a postal code. That's a good worldwide term for delivering mail, you know, the old-fashioned way where we actually had a piece of paper that we wrote something on and sent it uh, to somebody to deliver. And when we look at that, the postal code's job was to help us get close to the destination. And that's what really is happening at the network layer. We are segmenting the entire, I guess we could say, world through the internet and in our local area networks as well by segmenting them into logical addresses. It doesn't matter what the address is as long as it's unique and that we have the ability to find our way to get there. Now, if I use postal codes as an example, and I wanted to send some mail to an address at 999 Main Street in Seattle, Washington, 98101, and I do so from where I'm at in Boston, and I drop the letter into uh, a post office, well, the first thing the postal worker is going to do is see uh, that the zip code is not theirs, and so they're going to sort this to a delivery mechanism that's going to put it on a truck or a plane or a train that's going to get it, to, hopefully, in the most efficient way, most, or, or the best route, to that destination at 98101. Once it arrives at that network or that postal code, it's then up for those people to look at 99 Main Street within their segment and make the final delivery. We're going to talk about how that happens when we get down into layer two. But uh, right now, our goal is to be able to, again, segment the information or the networks to be able to facilitate an address scheme that allows these devices to be able to see what the destination network is. And that's important because that's all routers are really doing is looking at the destination network and sending the, the, uh, these uh, packets or these segments in the most efficient way to that destination, knowing at some point it'll eventually arrive at that destination and then that router can determine how to do the local delivery. The data link layer at layer two is where we see the local delivery take place. This is where we actually care about the physical address of what the, where that packet is supposed to go. Now, many different protocols occur within uh, the data link uh, area. The protocols are just, again, how the different machines on that local segment communicate with each other. Another important aspect is that we need to have a common uh, communications protocol at this layer two to be able to find a way to exchange all of the ones and zeros. And that is what this is about, by the way, is I'm getting ready to take this raw data, turn it into a bunch of ones and zeros, and transmit it from one place to the other. But if I translate it into a language that's foreign to somebody else or another system, then it's not going to make sense. And so we see a variety of different protocols, or what we call encapsulation models, at this, uh, at this location. The most common one we're going to deal with in the uh, world of the local area network is Ethernet. 
Surprisingly, the wide area network is getting more and more into Ethernet services, meaning that we're getting Ethernet not only in the local area, but also in the wide area networks. But there's many other types of encapsulations you may hear of or hear me talk about, things like frame relay, ATM uh, as examples, ISDN is another example of things that operate at layer two. And by the way, there's many more of those uh, types of encapsulations. Um, but again, it's a way of being able to format my ones and zeros in such a way that the other side understands them. Now, in most of these uh, situations, it is Ethernet, and so I'm going to use that as my example. As I talked about, I had an envelope, a letter I wanted to send in 999 Main Street, Seattle, Washington, 98101. Now, that 98101 was taken care of at layer three by getting me on uh, the, what did I say, the uh, truck, the train, or the plane to get me uh, hopefully in the most efficient uh, method to that destination. But once it arrives at that post office that is responsible for the zip code 98101, they then look at the actual physical address, 999 Main Street, hoping that within that district there is no duplicate address of 999 Main Street so that they can finish the delivery. Now, if there were duplicates, there'd be all sorts of messes there. And that's why we see the same thing when we talk about uh, the way in which we address objects. You know, when we talked about the IP address in the network layer, you're going to learn that it's a really broken into two pieces, a network portion and a host portion. So now we're looking at that host portion, hoping that that's not uh, duplicated within that network. And that's part of the local delivery. But the other part of this is, especially in the world of Ethernet, is that I still need to have a physical address. And so the way we see the physical addresses dealt with are often in the things we call the MAC address. That would be the media access control. Now I'm throwing a lot of acronyms, a lot of things that we're going to go into more detail on, uh, but I'm just trying to make sure you kind of have this overview of what's happening at the different layers. So now we're preparing to actually take this information, turn it into a bunch of ones and zeros, and we're actually going to address these, uh, and we call them frames at this point, we're going to address these frames to that physical address, and uh, we're going to use a variety of equipment to be able to finish that delivery. The most common type of device you would see at layer two is your network switch, or maybe, uh, depending if you're doing any other type of communications, uh, what we call a bridge. And again, I know that I'm just throwing out a, uh, equipment pieces at you, but I promise that you're going to know enough about all of these and a lot of detail to understand what their functions are. All right, so that's what's happening at the data link. We're looking at that physical address, getting ready to send this, things, this information as a bunch of ones and zeros. That takes us to the physical layer, layer one. That is the actual media by which we send the ones and zeros. So at layer two, we had some sort of encapsulation protocol like Ethernet where we would style the information, the ones and zeros, in a certain order and format so that it was uh, understood and known by the receiver. But that means it still has to be turned into ones and zeros. Now, the way in which we can transmit ones and zeros, it's a binary system. Uh, that means, you know, basically in the old days of, uh, of uh, vacuum tubes, it was either on or off. It's the same idea in this digital scale. The way we send it could be through the use of electrons over a copper cable. Most often we would talk about seeing an Ethernet cable or a, what we might call a Cat5 cable, uh, copper wires, so it's a, tr a set of twisted pair wires. Uh, we also in the uh, older days had the old coax, the things you would see going to your cable TV or from your satellite to your TV. Again, just a copper wire and finding a way to send ones and zeros. Um, we see these through the use of photons with fiber cables where we're actually sending uh, beams of light in a certain pattern that represents ones and zeros. Through the use of our wireless communications with our access points, we're using radio frequency to be able to encode a series of ones and zeros over a, you know, basically a radio frequency being transmitted from one point to another. No matter what that media is, it's carrying ones and zeros, and that's what we need to make sure is that we have the ability, the devices that can convert our data into the proper type of signal for the media that we use for transmission. That transit point from my computer system to that network usually is done through a, uh, what we call a network interface card, or what we hear a lot of talk about as a NIC. So uh, depending on the type of connection, if I'm connected to an Ethernet network, I would buy an Ethernet NIC, install it in my system, knowing that the job of that network card is to be able to convert things into the right type of transmission media uh, that it's connected to, if it's copper, into a bunch of electrons to signal ones and zeros. Now when you take a look at the local area network and compare that with the OSI model, that's where you're going to see a variety of different equipment coming in. Now it's really kind of hard to just sit there and throw out all of the different type of uh, equipment that you're going to see. 
but uh, we're gonna, I am going to break these things down for you. I do promise that. Now, in the OSI systems, we talked about the physical layer, and I said it was the media. Uh, you could call it the cabling. It's also some of the network devices that we use to uh, interconnect things. Back in the day, we used to use at layer one a way of connecting the different types of media together through a central uh, box called a hub. At least in the world of Ethernet, that's what we had. When it was coax, it was a way different world. But the idea was is that uh, a hub could do a number of things for us. Number one, it allowed several devices to connect into one central spot so they could all exchange information. But it was more that it was really an extension to the length of the cable. You know, without getting into too much detail and just throwing out a bunch of stuff that we're going to get into more, de you know, uh, discussions on, but, you know, every cable has uh, a length that it supports as far as the communications. Uh, your typical copper twisted pair is right around, uh, you, you know, the 300 feet, 100 meter range. And after that, the signal gets weak and needs something to help regenerate that signal, uh, and a hub is another device that could do that. But the way it works is that it's, uh, as I connect two hosts into the hub, it's as though I've really just taken the one cable and strung the two together. It's just gone through another device to help regenerate and retransmit uh, that signal. It doesn't change it in any way. It makes no decisions. It just says if it comes in, it goes out. It's like an extension. And I also said we needed a uh, type of a network card, a network interface card, to be able to convert our information to that physical layer uh, that we use, the cabling and the other types of network devices. So uh, again, what I'm trying to do is uh, compare some of the things that you would see uh, in the LAN, the local area network, as what's on the OSI. Now we got into the data link. We said that we actually had to have uh, hard-coded addresses. Well, they didn't have to be hard-coded, but we needed to have physical addresses. And we have devices that are out there capable of looking at that physical address and forwarding that information in the appropriate direction without having to cause what we would uh, looked at as collisions. And I do promise, to, I keep saying this, uh, I'm going to talk about these in more detail. You're going to get it. But I'm just comparing the different devices. I already said at the network layer that we used uh, uh, devices like routers to be able to uh, make decisions about what network you wanted to get to, usually through uh, the use of an IP address. Or in the old days of Novell, we had an IPX address. Uh, Apple Talk had their own way of doing addresses. At the transport layer, we had a variety of different protocols. TCP uh, is an example, UDP is another, SPX, uh, ways of being able to, again, make sure that two endpoints had a common language that they could talk to each other. Now, the things that they would send back and forth over this information might help maintain a session. Uh, it might be containing data that, uh, when reassembled, would be of a certain format for presentation that could be seen and viewed by an application like your web browser using HTTP. So all of those uh, things, those components that I talked about in the uh, local area network uh, would do in fact match with the OSI model. So that's another reason why it's nice to have a standard model so that we have a good way of building applications, of communicating information, of keeping track of our sessions, of having a common language, being able to actually get the information from one place in the world to the other place in the world through a set of logical addresses, getting that into a more specific address when it gets uh, close to the, or get, arrives in that network, and having the devices that can then deliver it to the end host and translate that into uh, their program. All of that are, is handled through the equipment that we see in the local area network as well as the protocols and the way the operating systems are designed to communicate with each other. And they all matched it up with the OSI model so that, again, if I needed to replace IP version 4 with IP version 6, I can make that replacement in the network layer and everything else would still remain the same and have the same capabilities and it made it very easy to start getting upgrades and new features into the different layers. Before the OSI model came out, we did have the TCP uh, or the TCP IP model. And you could say in many ways that the OSI model was uh, designed to kind of help represent what was happening in TCP. In the TCP, we had the application layer and uh, a lot of uh, applications written just for the TCP model, one of which I talked about was HTTP. So we really can communicate that and say, you know, that's like an application. But we had to remember that we were also using these protocols, here's another example, file transfer protocol, to transfer files of different types and how they are presented was part of the presentation, but don't forget FTP is still an application as well. Uh, and of course, we would hope that during an HTTP or an FTP session or using these that are uh, common apps for email, that we would get make sure we had the delivery to the right location, which is where we used a variety of different uh, programs to maintain the sessions. 
Now, this helps us at the upper end in uh, being able to have us work with the operating system to uh, understand different f uh, formats and uh, link them to programs that can let us view that, to have uh, the software make sure that our sessions were complete back and forth, but we still needed a common language. So at the uh, in the TCP uh, model, the TCP IP, there were two transport layer protocols, TCP and UDP. And that was that common language, as I said before, between the different endpoints. Now, um, what that uh, does for us, though, is it says, we say, well, why do we need two? Well, one is kind of uh, really based on connections. And so we call this a connection-oriented protocol. And the other is uh, connection-less. And that just really sounds bad, right? You'd say, why do I want a connection-less one? Don't I want to make a connection? Well, there are times uh, when you might want to send a message to more than one person at a time. And rather than send three separate or four separate or 20 separate sessions, you want to send it out as one broadcast or multicast. And so UDP being connection-less uh, makes that a lot easier for us to do. What I prefer to, to uh, call this, because it just seems like maybe it's nicer, is an unacknowledged protocol. And unacknowledged means that I, as, a, as a sender, I don't need to hear from you whether or not you received the packet because that won't change my mind about sending things to you. Whereas on TCP, everything really works around these acknowledgments, these ACK messages that go back and forth. So that's the uh, transport layer of the TCP IP architecture. Uh, the internetwork or the internet layer, sometimes I have seen it called the internetwork layer, is where we see the logical addresses of IP. In the TCP IP structure, we have IP version 4 and we have version 6 out there. Uh, version 4 is uh, what's still pretty much the current standard in much of the world, although our goal is to move to version 6. But uh, that uh, corresponded to the network layer, which was the logical, I remember the logical address. But there are communications that can occur at the internet layer that don't have to go up to the transport layer. A lot of them might be routing protocols, which uh, in this case, RIP, the uh, Routing Information Protocol, or OSPF, the Open Shortest Path First Protocol, allow routing devices to exchange the network information. If we are doing a multicast, we might have the uh, Internet Group uh, Management Protocol. And if we wanted to send a quick uh, message, uh, usually an error message of some kind, or a connection test, uh, then we would see uh, something communicated with uh, ICMP. And that means that I could uh, address something to somebody's IP address without going to a transport layer just to send a very simple communication. One of the many that uh, we see are uh, connection-oriented, like ping. Uh, we also get a lot of error messages, like uh, host unreachable, or uh, you know, no route to host, or something like that, that helps us uh, you know, get the quick message and realize there are problems on there. So we have communications that happen in the TCP IP stack that are considered layer three, part of the network layer. And uh, the last one is the, uh, in, in the TCP IP world is the network interface layer, uh, which is where we see uh, communications at the physical address. I mentioned Ethernet is a very common type of uh, encapsulation protocol. So is Token Ring. They both involved having physical addresses to uh, be able to communicate with each other. The same in our wireless LANs where we're using radio frequencies to do our communications. Now, most all of these are really describing things that occur at encapsulation layers, data link, but we also realize that they have to be turned into a bunch of bits so that they can be transmitted into the physical world as well. And that's another part of what happens. Now, because uh, of the uh, need for the physical address, there is a communication protocol that's defined in the TCP IP model known as the address resolution protocol that we use to uh, be able to uh, convert an IP address to a physical address so that we can do the uh, a delivery to the actual physical location.